action. Hello, welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy. I crack myself up every time I do this. I'm sorry, so unprofessional. So I'm Billy, and this is a podcast about vintage knitting. Today, I have a guest who is, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that she is an expert on vintage knitting. She does historical knitting. Well, I think she doesn't knit, but we're going to get more information from Sandy when she joins us in just a moment. I understand she's had a big thunderstorm over there in the UK, but hopefully she'll be joining us shortly. Um, before she does, I'll give you a heads up. She warned me that she speaks very quickly. I tend to be a little slower, but not to worry. If you're not accustomed to attuning your ear to the British version of the English language, you will find uh, on the bar below a little gear that you can pop up and you can get subtitles. So you'll be able to read the subtitles. You can also slow down the timing. So if you want to do it at half time or quarter time, you can. Just a little pointer. While we're waiting for Sandy, let me remind you that you can register for upcoming yarn auctions by going to the link that I'll put on the screen, as well as in the show notes below. Or I could also give you a little update on my genie. Here's my ribbing, very deep ribbing for 1940s sweater. And you can see I've made quite a bit of progress in the last several weeks, I'm really pushing to knit a couple more of these bands. I think I have this dark one, a light one, and one more dark one before I can cut my steaks. So I'm coming down the home stretch. Here's how the top looks. It's quite a bit narrower than the bottom because I've been decreasing in anticipation of opening up the neck steak and the armholes. Um, if you've watched my program before, you'll know that this is my first time out with steaking. So I'm a little bit nervous about it. I'm going to buy a check as suggested by Nancy, who's been a participant in the knit along. And I'm probably going to dig out a vintage crochet hook. I have two crochet hooks from the year one, one of them is very thin and I keep it locked away because it's very rarely used, but I think I'll be able to do the crochet edge. Um, there are a couple of pros who have suggested that method. So I'll be back with my group later in the month of October to discuss our uh, collective progress on our genies. So I promise to be right back with Sandy and here she is all the way from the UK. I'm glad that you were able to endure whatever weather storm you were having and to join us today. So before we get started talking about your historical knitting and the business that you have, I'm going to ask you the question I ask all of my guests. Please tell us about the town where you live, what country, and something that's there that if we were to visit, we would not want to miss and that we wouldn't find in some stupid tourist guidebook. Okay. So I'm in a town called Redditch in England. Um, we're right in the middle of the country. We're just basically off all the motorways all converge in the middle. That's where we are. Um, we're sort of a little bit near Stratford, a little bit near Birmingham. A lot of people have heard of those, so but less so about Redditch. We, um, if you came here, the bit that you would see from a tourist point of view is probably the only thing we've really got going for. It's a very, very small town. Um, and we're, it's famous for making knitted needles and uh, sewing needles and fish hooks. So that industry came up in Victorian times. We've got, a, we've got what's called Forge Mill Museum. And that's set up just down the road. And it shows you all the, how you make needles and you can go in there on school days and things. So there's lots of it in there to be done. Um, I am going to be on the next plane. That just sounds like yeah. the, next to the guy who told me about the mother of pearl button factory that's yeah. down the road from him. 
I, I put this in the A plus category of like it's must nice not thing. miss. Wow. And it's, it's got the working water mill still and Aww. still all working. And that's in the grounds of an abbey. Um, the Cistercian Abbey, I think it is. I think it was Cistercian. But basically it was an abbey that was um, raised to the ground by Henry VIII in 1500 and whatever. So there's the ruins of the abbey. And so the town's been here since that time, but it was renovated. It's a new town. It was renovated in the 60s into a, a grey concrete. <laughs> But the museum yeah. and knitting needles. The museum's still there, and we've still got some of the old town. And um, we're really close, um, as I was saying, we're really close to the, the Tudor side of things and the historical side of things right on our doorstep. So it's lovely. Okay, so let's get into what exactly it is that you do. If I'm remembering correctly, you personally do not knit. Is that right? I can knit. But you, have, but you have well, a I business that involves knitting and just tell us about that. Okay. So <laughs> I'm better at crochet than I am knitting, but I can knit. And what happened was um, my, my nan died in 2016 and she taught me to knit and she taught my mom to knit. My mom was knitting a reproduction 1940s pattern that when, when nan died, we had to clear the house out. We got all sorts of patterns and whatever come from her house. You know what it's like when, when someone passes away, you have to trawl through things. And my mum was knitting a pattern and I was looking for work. I'd gone through a divorce and I was a single mum. And it suddenly dawned on me that we could make these jumpers and sell them to reenactors. And the vintage fans was, was what I first thought of. But um, my job used to be as a business coach. So I know when you're knitting, you've got all that time that's just basically dead money you can only sell what you can knit so my idea was if I got other people to knit it I'd then sell it so I do all the business functions the social media and I used to go to the events and, and take the orders and so on so um, what we do is we do knit for stock so I've got the Etsy shop um, and I sometimes do events but I've got fibromyalgia so I can't do all the lifting and running around anymore like I used mm. to um so I take the order negotiate the price and then I send the pattern and the wallet out to a knitter who knits it for me and they send it back in pieces still um so I sew it up I sew in the ends and all the bits that knitters don't like doing I'll do that bit and they can just do the knitting how it's many of these contract knitters would you say you have um, I've got about six to eight at the moment that are sort of my core people. Um, and I've got others because, because they have to be self-employed as well. So they're not my staff as such. Some of them have got their own knitting businesses. Um, so when they haven't got any work, they'll message me and ask me if I've got any for them. And I have. Um, and I'll say probably six that really only knit for me and, and are there for all the, all the challenges that we get. Now, can you give us some idea of who some of your clients are? Um, a big one, if I just reach behind me and grab a picture. Sure. Um, you see that okay? Proud to supply Christopher Wren. So that's the Christmas character Christmas. in the mousetrap. Mm -hmm. So um, London's longest running West End show. Um, we've knitted for that for, well, since, since 2017, we've knitted for that. So every time there's a cast change, we <laughs> they need a bigger sweater. <laughs> yep. And also I've forgotten the name of the lady in it. There's a lady in it, a lady in it as well, who wears um, a short knitted jacket and we sometimes knit that for them as well. We do that one. Now I know um, that you do things in the states as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, I know I've supplied Hollywood because the the address was a studios in Hollywood. It's going to be on a TV series, um, but I don't know what the TV series is. Um, and that's an American production. Um, we've got a contract, but unfortunately, I'm under an. An NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, 
Um, we have got a TV show that will be seen in America and in England, probably uh, mid to late next year. And that's knitted and designed by us. So, so the be... NDA, you can't divulge it ahead of time, but once it's out, are you allowed to? No. Yeah, you'll know. <laughs> okay. I'm never going to shut up without it for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we do lots in the West End. We do, um, we've been approached by a cinema, a theatre production in Sydney. Um, trying to think, mum, who else have we got? Mm-hmm. Yeah, museums. We've done um, Black Country Living Museum, which is near me. And that's one that's worth looking up as well. Just having a look at what's there. It's um, old houses. Um, we've done the Space Centre. I just reproduce um, the Space Helmet. Or well, was somebody working with the Space Centre. A space helmet production. Um, I can't get my words out. Designed in the 1940s, it wouldn't have been very effective in space, but they weren't in space at that time. So it's basically an adapted flying helmet. Um, Gilbert White Museum, which was um, it's all to do with Scott of the Antarctic and it's the Antarctic explorations. Mm. We produced stuff there. So yeah, museums. But I suppose my core people are the reenactors, the World War II reenactors and others. Um, we've got quite a large um, American Civil War Society in England. So there's been some American Civil War knits we've done as well. Isn't that interesting that it's it. that American <laughs> history is so big in the UK? Yeah. So tell us about the two garments that are on your mannequin. It's, um, from a Stitchcraft magazine from the 1940s. Um, so Stitchcraft was, I don't know, are you aware of Stitchcraft? Yes. Yeah, so a common one, just uses up some scraps of wool um, and just a, a, common, a common design we do really. But the important one is this cardigan that I've just placed over the top. But that's basically a, a copy of World War II uh, Army Nursing Corps, ANC, um, the US Army nurses cardigan that they had. Um, we can't get them over here. I, I reenact as ANC when I could fit in my uniform before I had a baby. And you can't buy, we have to import from America a lot of things. And the cardigan's one of the things I've not really produced. So I copied one and we could do it now if people want it. Is it my imagination or is the cardigan of a lighter weight than the jumper underneath? It's the same. It's the same wool. It's just the stitch. So this is um, probably a 5-2 ribbon. So knit five pearl two and just do a wide rib. Um, and this is uh, a black, like a blackberry stitch. It's, it's got texture to it. But there's, so floats, same, behind, same there's floats behind that. So it, the fabric yeah. is thicker. It's, um, if I show you, that's the inside, is it the inside? Yeah. What weight yarn are you using? Is this three ply? Four ply. Four Four ply. ply. Yeah. You can't really get much thinner than that easily. Um, the four ply we find knits up to much the same, much the same tension as the pattern. Um, and we're quite lucky that there's, um, it's fairly reasonably priced. I find in the past when I've worked with people that live abroad and they want to supply wool, they pay an awful lot of money for wool. Whereas over here, well, pure wool is probably about, I pay about three pounds for 50 grams over here. So, and I think it's a bit cheaper over here, but it depends what you get. It depends on the quality. If it's hand spun, you know, you know the old thing, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're uh, jonesing to travel again so that we can come and buy some of that Shetland wool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd love, yeah, I'd love to read from the source. In Shetland. <laughs> Go to Shetland to buy it. It's worth it. My dad's wife was a nurse in the army, but she was army. She wasn't the division that you're describing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if she would have had a sweater like that. If she was women's army corps, it would have been really similar. Yeah, there's not much difference. There are differences, but um, a lot of the sweaters would have been private purchase anyway or privately made mm. so it's one of those things with reenactment you can never say people didn't do it because if somebody gave you a jumper you're not going to not wear it if you're cold are you <laughs> so. well she was in the desert 
she where it was 120 cold. degrees. So I <laughs> doubt not that cold, maybe. she was cold. But sometimes <laughs> when she was on R and R, she might have needed a sweater. I know she went to France. She went to Germany. This jumper. So this is one that's not long come back to me. And if I just flip it inside out for you, you can see how the knitters work. So um, this one will have been knitted in the round, I think. Yeah, knitted in the round, that one. So they send it me back with all these to sew in, which I love. I love sewing ends in. I'll do it for ages watching the TV. So Why somebody... do they have all of those long straight um, ends? This, Wow. That's where they started a new reason. color? That's the start of the new color, yeah. So they so, just left you plenty to weave in. They leave me loath to leave in. I, I am going to worry about um, moving it up or anything like that. I just want them to just knit it. Because what we do do is, can you see the inside? There, we twist every stitch. So that um, when somebody puts it on, they can't trap their fingers or pull it or ruin the jumper. So we get them to work every stitch like that. Wow. More than putting it across, which they love me for. Does that end up taking twice as long? Depends on the knitter. Um, I, I quote a customer six months for one of these, but realistically, it's probably two to three months knitting it and me getting around to sewing the ends in. <laughs> We've got it in different colorways. There's sometimes a different colorway pulls it up. I think you want to put a different colorway up. Yes, I'd like to see other colorways. Why not? So we've got we've got um this one. I can see more detail here and it looks it's so interesting to see the same sweater, two different colorways, because they look like a completely different yeah. design. I, I think the one behind me is the same. Yeah, this one's the same as well. Great. Here you can really see the X's and the O's. That's it. So I can I can send you some stills. So I can, we've done this one so many times. It's um. In the 1920s and it's based off um what you'd call him edward the eighth duke of wales Prince yes of wales, oh the big it? fashion maven yeah you know when he brought back fair isles from the golf course and and everything else um it's it's based off one of his and there's a painting of him wearing something really similar where he's got a little dog under his arm oh stunning so it's based off based off those Oh, maybe I can find that image somewhere online. I can send it. I can send everything across to you if it, if it helps. Quite of nice. him with his dog. Yeah. Oh, lovely! That would be yeah. sweet. This is we've done this with a white background so you can read the detail. Um, so yeah, this is a probably made 10 12 of these, make these loads. <laughs> I've got knitters that love Fair Isle, love working in the round, love doing the very intricate, tiny work when you're winding like that all the time. And then I've got other knitters that will knit me like the army comforts, like um. This, this World War One one. Wait, before you talk about this one, the Fair Isle, what's the gauge and what size needle are they working on? It will be four, four ply again. It's a four ply. So how many stitches per inch or centimeter? I'm not sure. Seven to nine. Seven to nine to an inch. It's a big difference. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> depends on the pattern. That one. 325 mil needles, isn't it? 3.25 mil needles and yeah. So it's probably seven. Yeah. Well, you'd think it would be, which is where it gets difficult. Um, 
but a lot of what we do is sizing up old patterns and the knitters all knit differently. So what we do is we get them to knit a gauge first to see what their natural gauge is with what the pattern says and then to upsize it using maths. So they're, they're doing that as well as maths. If they naturally knit at nine to an inch, they're going to be adjusting it maths wise. You just mentioned something very interesting to me on a tangent, sizing up, because the next project I'm working on, I'm taking something that I think is for size 34 inch or 35 inch bust, and I need to go up. Doing the, the torso part of it isn't hard and, you know, adjusting the shoulder is not hard. My concern is sizing up the sleeves so that I can get the sleeve to fit in properly. So I wonder if you're able to give me and my viewers any ask my mom any tips on how to do that because that would be really helpful. Any tips, mommy? So normally mom we find that just knitting the sleeves normal as the pattern is okay. If you're doing it for yourself, you can measure and check. But this part of the body like my shoulders and like this part under my arm doesn't really change regardless of how big I am here or how big my tummy is or whatever. So we normally knit the sleeves much the same. I know that from their measurements, the sleeve is 10 inches around and I need a bigger sleeve than that. And I think from shoulder to underarm in that pattern, because it is a, a more slender woman. I think it was six and three quarter inches. I know that I need more like eight do inches. Need, do you need extra length as well? No. Just, yeah. I, would you a bigger split arm, the, bigger split arm size? A bigger arm size, mama, would you split the rows evenly up the arm? Yeah. yeah. So if it's, let's say it's seven inches on your pattern and you want it 10, so you've got to add three, got to add three inches on. And if you're knitting seven inches, uh, sorry, seven stitches to an inch, that's 21 stitches. So seven times three. You know? So add those on at the cast on and then just follow it and knit it as long as you need to. You can always cast off more if you But it's the circumference of the arm side. So it's not, I think it's not just a matter of adding three inches. I, I think it has to be the right contour. I'm probably going to end up playing with it. And there is an element of playing. And what I find I do a lot with the sewing up is um, stretching one piece against another. So if we want the, if we want the sleeves to puff up, I'll stretch the main body as I sew it up. And then so when it contracts again, it brings it in. And if mm. if I've got extra sewing to lose, if I've got extra pieces to lose under here, um, I'll sort of pull it down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to make it fit it round into. I think we call it bodging. I don't know if bodging is an American term you use, but we bodge it. <laughs> yes, fudge. <laughs> I, I studied mathematics and we talked about a fudge factor. You know, if you needed yeah. to make something work out, you could just add in a little fudge factor. Yeah. This particular sweater I'm talking about, the top of the sleeve has an interesting construction. It the, steps in and then it yeah. goes up like a little uh, square at the top. And then you fold it. the sides will be sewn together. And I've never seen this before the yarn is held double just for that upper little square. So I think it'll make like a thicker shoulder padding. Sounds interesting. Yeah, so you'll have to watch my program and see how I'm progressing with that. <laughs> That's in the future. That's next month. That's not happening until I finish my fair aisle. My viewers are probably getting sick of seeing this, but this uh, that, that's like edward the eighth one as well isn't it that's not, not the same pattern no it's i don't think it's the same pattern these change the hexagons and then it's the eight pointed stars and oh, then yeah. hexagon. they're all they're all different but this is 11 and a half stitches to the inch 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So what's that, like three millimeters? On a US one, no, it's smaller than three millimeters. I think it's 2.25, if I'm not mistaken, US one. Wow. So <laughs> this has taken me close, swear. close to four months. Wow. It's the beautiful. only thing I've worked on for four That's months. Really beautiful. And it'll be my first time steaking. I've never steaked before. So there are three steaks, the neck and the two armholes. It's a V-neck. So, yeah, a lot of work. Woo. I still, one of the things I can't do, I can't knit and then wear it myself. Because by the time I've actually finished something, I'm fed up with it. Well, <laughs> I've become much more, I've become much more selective about what yeah. I knit so that I don't have too much output. Anyway, we're digressing. Let's get back to it. <laughs> Let's get back to your sweater. So the last thing you showed was the World War II nurse's cardigan. It's down there, yeah. Um, so when we started, it was all things like that. It wasn't really the Fair Isles. We started, um, I'll be honest, I was going out with a World War II reenactor and it started with making, you know, making him a jumper. But then I finished with him and went out with a different one. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> so yeah. Um, so it was always, it was a lot of finding the right color car keys and the right patterns to use. We've got lots um, of flat patterns. So we've got ones like this. You see that? Yes. Yeah. Um, and this one is the one we use the most. And it's not even British. I have seen this, not the inside, but I've seen this cover. Yeah, it's the American one. So it's the American forces, but the great thing with that is it's double knitting wool. So um, I don't know why they had it thicker, but, but yeah, there's so many American reenactors in this country. You would not believe it, including my partner. Wow. But anyway, he does, he does the Korean War, so I get to knit 1951 things. Anyway, so yeah, World War I. Um, this is one, it's it's not my favorite color green, I have to admit, but the supplier changed the dye. Um, it's just a plain V-neck cardigan. Um, the World War One reenactors normally want scarves and gloves and balaclavas to go with their uniforms. Um, and this one was going over to Michigan. So say Michigan, am I? Michigan. Michigan. Mm -hmm. For a group that's just starting up doing World War One Canadian. You follow that. <laughs> What's interesting to me is that these cardigans really haven't changed. Right. It's a hundred years and we're still basically doing the same silhouette. That's it. And even um, the American Civil War one we did, um, it was in brioche stitch, but it was still basically a rectangle that did that, folded round and two rectangles. And that's, that's all it is. Um, so quite, quite therapeutic that one. I like doing that one. Um, but yeah, nothing changes much from that time. I think things change a lot more once you get into your acrylic dyes in the fifties and people starting to knit to make statements and things like that. But when it's just to keep you warm, yeah, rectangles does it, doesn't it? Really, pretty much. I've knit some vintage sweaters that were not rectangles. Oh, yeah, the you, you nicer ones, things. But everything looks, as you say, you can wear a, a 1910s pattern or 1915 pattern, and nobody would know it was a pattern because you could make it look modern. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. It's like, I mean, this one I was looking at earlier. I was talking to you before. That one. That's going to go on Etsy. And I can see that on, we have Christmas jumper day. Do you remember they have a Christmas jumper day where people in, in offices and things um, raise money for, I can't remember which charity is, but most, most workforces promote this Christmas jumper day and Christmas jumpers are a big thing over here. <laughs> Massive thing. So Can I we that have all. like, there's ugly sweater, maybe it's an ugly sweater yeah, ugly day sweater. where yeah. people bring out not just Christmas jumpers, but they bring out like the ugliest, thing yeah. that they can find you know that it's brown and green with 
mustard or uh, I don't know, some ugly design on it. People come up with all kinds of things. Yeah. So yeah, the, I'm trying to get some things on Etsy ready for Christmas, but we've had some quite big orders coming, so they're not getting made. So that might be the only Christmas jumper we have this year. For a medieval reenactor, mm. I do medieval myself as well, where we do 1390. So we're not at war, basically. England didn't, didn't, England didn't fight a war in 1390, little fact for it. Um, this is what's called a Monmouth cap. If you can see that, or sometimes an acorn cap. And it's basically, it's knit on four pins like a bobble hat. I did do this one. And you um, have to pick the hem back up, except I didn't do it all the way around. You pick the hem back up, you fold it back onto your needles, and then knit it just like a, just like a bobble hat. But then it has to be felted because it was outdoor wear. Um. So it has to be. Um, has to be waterproof so i make a lot of them and the blue bonnets which i've got so it doesn't look much different it looks like a beret to the say to the untrained eye even to the trained eye it looks like a beret but if you can see that so that would be for um jacobite rebellion in Coven. so basically we, uh, we've got such a history of wars here that they're always reenacting different wars and then when they don't, they find some American ones to read. <laughs> but is it always this color, the blue bonnet? Always, always blue. Always this shade of blue. And it denoted um, in Scotland when in like the 1600s and around that time, depending on which war, but basically that shows that they, they belong to a certain army. And you've also got, Scottish people came down into England to help during the civil war in England, um, or to help, <laughs> to, 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 lend their, <laughs> to lend their support in the English civil war as well. So a certain group of those would have worn the blue as well. I'll, I can send you all the information if you want and dates and things like that, but basically blue bonnets. Are, do, you ever, do you ever get requests for hats from the 1920s 30s 40s like the art deco period um we do, well, i've got lots of patterns for them um you? the one that i'd make a lot of is a tamashanta so like the beret but it comes mm -hmm. really big out and in and then with a pom-pom on it um the pattern i use for that is from about the 1920s uh, to be honest i use it it's, off, it's on archive.com uh, dot org archive.org from but nothing Columbia. more like Hollywood, like sophisticated. Never been asked for it. No. The no. thing is, though, um, putting it in blunt blunt terms, I probably would charge too much for it. So there's um, a lot of people making those things. The 1940s is a huge thing over here for reenactment. Um, I did an event at the weekend. To be honest, it would be, you know, we've been doing them for a while again now, and. Some of the girls like to dress up very Hollywood and have the hats like at the, at the angle and um, beautiful clothes and things like that. And they will go to, there's a company called Heritage Milliner that makes the hats or your, if I say hobby knitters, I don't mean this in any way, shape or form as an offense, but people who knit then sell and knit then sell themselves, as opposed to me who just <laughs> knitting farm I've got going on. <laughs> um, so, they will more likely to make them and then price them more reasonably. Whereas for me, I'm looking at all the other costs that I run. And against they've paid me to do it, they could have probably got, got it cheaper. I, would, I wouldn't say no to doing it, but there'd be a waiting time and there'd be a cost. So if people want to find you, you're on Etsy. I want yeah. to put your Etsy information into the show notes. So okay. I'll get that from you. Um, is there anything else that you want people to know, like what shows you're going to be at, or uh, you know, do you want people to find you? Okay. Let's tell them um, now. Okay, so I'm on in, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Facebook was where we started. Um, I don't have an, a website anymore, so anything that says vintagestitches.com is not relevant anymore. So I don't want to do it, but. Um, Vintage Stitches History Knitwear, Historical Knitwear is the, the company name. We're on Facebook. We're running, we're going into, we're into winter now here. So we've just done the last show of the season. 
So, so then we start again in February with um, the Living History in Worcester show. We're not far from Worcester here, um, which is held in Worcester city centre. The group of us, we're Worcester reenactors, we're all together and we all converge at the start of the season there in whatever era we do. So you'll see English Civil War having a point with American World War II <laughs> there. Um, and then we start the events. But what I do, I don't, I don't trade at events anymore. Um, but I do tend to post on my social media whether I'm going to be there or not. And people can quite happily talk to me there. You know, I'll, I'll take, I quite often take deliveries rather than posting them and things like that. So I'll always talk to people. I'm quite happy to chat on Messenger and private message on the on Instagram and Facebook as well. Even if it's just an inquiry, people can pick my brains. It doesn't matter. You, you know, in terms of um, commissions, we, we basically work off commissions. That's essentially what we do. But nobody's going to get anything this side of Christmas if they haven't already spoken to us. So <laughs> I think that I've heard you say that you're always looking for knitters. If people Always, always looking for knitters, yeah. If people want to knit for you, what's the best way to contact you? On your Facebook page? Yeah. Yeah, Facebook or Instagram. Um, with the knitters, um, there's, there's two ways. I prefer to have people that will do the commissions, but because I have to post the, fab, the wool and things out, they really need to be in the UK because of the postage involved. If people have made something that they think is appropriate to what we sell, I'm quite happy to buy that from them within reason. So like um, one of the ones I've shown you already, I've bought off somebody already made. However, I will try and sell it for much higher than they've sold it to me for. That's the best way of putting it. I'm not, I'm not cheap. I'm, I'm fairly cheap compared to what some people charge over here, but um, I, I would only buy something if I could make a profit on it, in, in being, being blunt, because I'll also supply shops that do the same to me back. So... If somebody's knitted something just for the love of knitting it and it's vintage and they think it fits with what we do, they're more than welcome to send me a photograph and tell me what they want to pay for it. And if it's something that I can work with, that's great. On the understanding, they realise I will then brand it up and sell it myself. It's always 100% wool. No, acrylic's fine. Acrylic's oh. fine. Um, reenactors, reenactors like acrylic because you can wash it when you've been out all day in the mud and smelly. Okay, the, so that's interesting. I didn't know. The coat, if you, if you, the coat hanging up is covered in mud off my daughter from her reenactment experience this weekend. So it's because it's we have to be able to wash things. So I'm um, quite happy to do acrylic um, or a mix. The most common thing we do is the mix. Um, so, sort of, I don't know, 65, 70, 70% wool. So it looks and feels like wool. It looks realistic, but goes in the washing machine. Great. I'll just say thank you so much for okay. being willing to spend some time. I know the technology is sometimes a challenge, yeah, but we, we prevailed. And I now you know how to Zoom. About doing Zoom. And now I just opened up a whole new world for you. Well, maybe you'll get some more Hollywood commissions if they can Zoom with you. <laughs> no problem. I can do that. <laughs> All right. Not thanks, Sandy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.